My name is Pete Grote. I'm 77 years old, and it's my great pleasure to introduce Phil Arnout. <clears throat> Phil uh, is the kind of person that I looked up to when I was an adolescent during World War II, uh, a bomber pilot uh, fighting what was the Nazi barbarism in Europe, and um, he has then since become a teacher, a naturalist, uh, an activist, not the least of all, and <clears throat> who was a warrior in the 40s in a just cause, is an activist in the year 2006 in a just cause, an activist for peace. And I'd like to present him in the context of, of that role in life as an activist for peace. Phil? <coughs> Let's go to the World War II experiences. Um, how old were you, uh, and where were you when you first became aware of Imperial Japan, or Nazi Germany, or Fascist Italy? Uh, Pete, I was probably first aware of Japan's imperialism. 1931, when Manchuria was invaded, I only remember because my parents were concerned and I'm sure there was a newspaper uh, invasion of Manchuria, and there was talk at the dinner table about that, and I, do re I know that <laughs> I was first aware of it. Then there was talk, the, the, the word on the street was, amongst us kids, uh, uh, six, seven years old, that someday there probably would be war with Japan. That was the word on the street. Uh, there was an incident called the Panay, I think, incident. Mm -hmm. And uh, so somehow I, I picked up, this would be 1931-32, when I would be six, seven years old. And about, when did you first experience your really negative feelings about fascism? I became aware of fascism in, in Europe, as distinct from Japan, probably 1934, my father drove me down to the Lagunita store from this cabin in the summer of 34, and he came back with a newspaper, and there was a, he had a very drawn and stern look on his face, and the headline said, Italy invades Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. And he told me a little bit about it, and I learned a little bit about Italy. And then my mother and grandmother were very well read on the subject of Nazi Germany. And my grandmother used to listen to Hitler on the shortwave radio here in this cabin. Really? And she'd be knitting and shaking her head as he was speaking. Did she understand German? She understood German. I see. Uh, and so somehow, uh, though my main thrust was uh, athletics, I, w I picked up that uh, something about Nazi Germany, and then my mother read a book called Out of the Night by Jean, a man named Jan Walton, mm -hmm. who had escaped a Nazi concentration camp. Mm -hmm. And uh, she went into details about that and Nazi Germany. So it would be in the middle and late 30s that I became increasingly aware, and certainly when I got to high school, it was taken up in the classroom. Well, that's interesting. So it would be between 12 and 14. Mm -hmm. I remember <clears throat> those er that era th mainly through newsreels, because my grandmother was a was a movie f fan oh. and used to take me to the movies twice a week. So I remember the Japanese invasion of Manchuria, say in the later 30s, um, and uh, the war in Spain, that sort of thing, and all the various propaganda films that emanated from Germany and and other sources. Um, what was the attitude towards fascism in uh, in your neighborhood, in your immediate environs, among your neighbors? Insofar as I was aware of it, and, and this is now when the war had begun in Europe in 1939 with the invasion of Poland, uh, some of the kids that we played Sandlot football with were very anti-British. They were they're probably because of their parents, and mm -hmm. the feeling was that that we had gone into World War I to pull British chestnuts out of the fire, that's the way they put it. Mm -hmm. And I remember in 19, I think it was when the hood was sunk by a, a German battleship, it may have been the Bismarck. It was know. the Bismarck, and, yeah. Uh, we were playing Sandlot football, and in those days, 
uh, without television, if there was extra news, it came on the radio, right. or a kid would hit the street with a, with a special paper called Extra. Right. And this kid was saying, Extra, Extra, and uh, Hood sunk by Bismarck. And mm -hmm. I remember a bunch of the kids applauding, there's your British Navy for you, down to the bottom of the sea where it belongs. Interesting. And there were some arguments over this. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I was, my parents were very pro pro-British or anti-Nazi, especially my mother and, and grandmother. So uh, sometimes I, I remember once the game got interrupted by a rather heated argument on, uh, over that incident. Uh, so I, I, I think probably, uh, you know, I wasn't canvassing the neighborhood, but I think uh, certainly looking back, throughout the country and at that time in the late 30s there was a d division in this country over whether uh, well many people were neutral in their thinking they were not pro-nazi but they thought we didn't belong in this war that's simply mm -hmm. another european struggle and that was charles Lindbergh's position he wasn't yeah. well he had been wined and dined by the nazis and he was impressed by them but uh, i was not I would say that there was a mix in the neighborhood, mm -hmm. but a, a lot of kids not uh, particularly interested, really. Mm -hmm. we, we were really, football was the main interest yeah. then. That was all to change. Well, I, I certainly uh, reinforced that view because I was raised in Minnesota, and uh, the, uh, the feeling was overwhelmingly isolationist. Um, <clears throat> there were the America Firsters, which Lindbergh was a part of, yeah, but the yeah. overall sentiment was, why should we be involved in another one when we did so, uh, we uh, did so uh, poorly in the last one, in a sense, of investing our resources and men and people. Yeah. Um, when, uh, how old were you when uh, World War II actually started with the German invasion of Poland in 1939? I see, September 39. Uh, I would be. F 14 in my, somewhere in, in uh, beginning my sophomore year in high school. Mm -hmm. uh, so I guess I was 15. I just turned 15 the, the previous July. So I was 15 <coughs> and I was very aware now with the invasion of Poland uh, in September of 39. Mm -hmm. um, did you ever see the, uh, the, Ger the German propaganda film they released called The Baptism of Fire? No, I never saw it. It's interesting because on December 7th, 1941, I was in the movie theater and they were showing as part of a double feature this German propaganda film which had been uh, dubbed in English called uh, The Baptism of Fire or Feuer Ordnung and it was the chronicle of the, of the invasion of Poland. Wow, and yeah. it was shown in an American theater? In an American theater in the Midwest. I, I was subsequently to, to come across the film Triumph of the Will. Oh, yes. That uh, German photographer, a woman, I forget her name. Lenny Reifenstahl. Uh, well, maybe, I, maybe I did remember her name, but couldn't mm -hmm. pronounce it. Um, I did, do, and I showed that to my students subsequently after, it was long after the war. Oh, yes. Yes, that was a seminal film for the Nazis. Yeah. That and the Olympics, which she filmed as the Olympia. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, did that attack, did the invasion of Poland and the subsequent fall of, of Norway and Denmark and the, and the uh, subsequent attack on France, did that change the attitudes in your neighborhood, among your schools? I think so. I think so. Uh, those who were isolationists were not necessarily pro-Nazi at all. They just mm -hmm. felt that that was a European matter. It was just an age-old, part of the age-old uh, European struggles we needed to stay out. But I think a lot of people who had that attitude, who were isolationists, thought France would hold, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as she had in 1914, long mm -hmm. before we became involved. Uh, with the, f They stopped the Germans at the First Battle of the Marne. Right, exactly. And after that, it was just a stalemate, mm -hmm. a bloody stalemate, a horrible stalemate. Yeah. But with the fall of France, my fa I remember my father saying when he came home from, uh, he was a doctor, he came home from the office or wherever, or the hospital, that he could see on the faces of people looking at the newspapers in the, in the newsstands uh, an expression that indicated fear or concern. And I guess this was uh, expressed at the at dinner table, certainly at our dinner table. And we were shocked when France fell, very shocked. Mm -hmm. And then worried because now England stood alone. So this, uh, there was a sudden rush, and I would say uh, there was a, a general change in attitude. Uh, n not necessarily an attitude uh, 
that was such that uh, people b believed that we should go over and, and get into the war, which my parents did. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it was an attitude sufficiently, I think, strong to support Roosevelt's Lend-Lease program, which was to provide material aid and military aid to the, to the English after the fall of France. Mm -hmm. And uh, subsequently, there was the U-boat war before we became involved. Yeah. And did that change people's opinions even further? I think so. I think it was the USS Robin Moore that was sunk early by a torpedo, and then the Reuben James went down. Mm -hmm. uh, most, of the, uh, most of the seamen were lost. I think this began to change American attitudes. I, uh, the, the America Firsters were still pretty firm, and they held their rallies. Uh, and, and I've seen footage of Lindbergh speaking to the America First uh, rally in, in Madison Square Garden. But uh, I think there was a general uh, change in, in, in attitude in the country. Um, what, was, uh, what was your reaction when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor and where were you? I was at home Sunday morning, the phone rang. It was my friend John Hardgrave, whose father was my pediatrician, he said, did you hear the news? I said, what news? He said, the Japanese have bombed Pearl Harbor. And I said, where's that? <laughs> and uh, then he explained what had happened. And I don't recall that I had a, a powerful emotional reaction. I had some. Uh, I certainly uh, read the newspapers mm -hmm. uh, avidly. Uh, I even kept a diary on the war when the Japanese began to expand through, through Southeast Asia and into the Philippines. Uh, so I was concerned. In fact, on the night of September the 8th, 1941, uh, after the Pearl Harbor attack one, uh, the day before, I was a self-appointed air raid warden, and a few, a number of us were. We were I was 17, and we ran down the street telling people to turn out their lights. And hearing the commotion, they would come forward and turn on the porch <laughs> lights. So we lit up the whole block, you know. And there was a feeling that there was a feeling that we might get bombed. Uh -huh. So we had a, a, a two or three uh, uh, buckets of sand and other materials that I, I can't now remember that were designed. We we had the hoses all in position in case there was an incendiary attack uh, on San Francisco, and there was a fear that that was going to happen. Uh, so. Uh, I was aware, but I wasn't afraid that I recall because it still uh, it still seemed far away, except for the possibility the city would be bombed. But then, when it didn't happen for two or three days, I think we relaxed and didn't think it would happen. That's interesting. And what about uh, the internment of Japanese citizens? I'm ashamed to say, in 1942, when this began, I was so involved in track. That while I know knew it was happening, uh, I paid very little attention to it. Mm -hmm. uh, I may not even been aware of it for a time. So, you know, subsequently, in the years later, I've you know, when I was teaching, I, I went into the subject in great detail uh, because it was a violation of the constitutional rights of American citizens. It was a shameful thing. But at the time, the my world revolved around track. Mm -hmm. I was a track star, and I was. Uh, the, uh, this was my last year, and I wanted to win the All City Half Mile, and that was my primary and almost exclusive objective in life. So I'm really ashamed to say that I, I really didn't have much awareness, and wasn't active. Uh, mm -hmm. nor, nor was anyone that I knew. That was the next question. Yeah, I, I don't. Uh, my mother told a Japanese maid that she had that it was for her own good. And my mother was not a reactionary Republican, but she wasn't reactionary. I think she sincerely believed that it was for their own good, fearing that they would be that they would be attacked by vigilantes. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, but there was no. I was not aware of any movement. I only know that a good colleague, a good friend of mine, and a colleague for many years, a guy I met at Cal Berkeley right after uh, before the war, uh, his mother as an active Christian Baptist, went down to Tanferan and brought blankets and food to the uh, Japanese, American Japanese. And uh, but I only learned that after the war. You know, it's interesting. Um, we left out the, so the German invasion of Russia in 1941. 
yeah. in June 41. What influence did that have on people? Did that make any difference? Was there a sense that uh, that somehow uh, the war was beginning to assume even greater proportions? Yes. As best I can remember, I was a junior in high school, and I remember that I was a counselor at a camp in, in near Mount Lassen, Fed the River Meadows Boys Camp. And I followed, as best I could, with the newspaper that came every day, the uh, German invasion of Russia. And of course, initially, they overwhelmed the Russians. And uh, it appeared that they were going to, going to succeed in conquering Russia, and thus they would have a complete hold o over all of Europe and all the Russian resources. But Alan Gay and other counselors said to me, I refuse to believe that the Germans are going to win this. That's all he said. And I just remember he said, you know, that I can just hear him now. And we were all, I was pulling for Russia, and I think all, all of us were pulling. My parents and uh, were, were hoping, that, and by this time we were sending Len Least to the Soviet Union, so the position of the United States government was we must help the Soviet Union, even, as, even though there was a strong uh, anti-communist feeling in this country, and we didn't even recognize the communist government of Russia until sometime in 1933. I mean, our own government didn't right, recognize right. it. But uh, there, was a, there was a turning, uh, that by this time, uh, Pearl Harbor was uh, a few months off, mm -hmm. and uh, I think uh, people were pulling for Russia. And somewhere along the line, the Life magazine came out with a full picture of Joseph Stalin. Uh, and there was a very complimentary article about the Russian struggle and about the guerrilla warfare behind the German lines. And uh, he became known somewhere along the line as Uncle Joe. Oh, yes. Tyrant that he was. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, but I, I think I have somewhere downstairs the, uh, the uh, Life magazine with his picture, full bleed. Uh, Joseph Stalin, then you, there was a story about the Russian resistance to the German invasion. And That's this was sometime in 42, because I was not yet in the military, so it had to be 42. I'll just uh, do a little anecdote here. When the Germans invaded Russia, um, I was in a movie theater with my father. I was visiting him in Portland, Oregon. My father and mother were divorced. And uh, he said the conventional wisdom was the Russians won't last six weeks. Three wow. years, two years later, he was working for the Soviet purchasing agency, oh. and he made a good he made a good deal of money working as an expediter <laughs> and engineer for the Soviet purchasing agency of the United States. Well, I think probably in the summer, the invasion started June twenty second, mm -hmm. uh, an invasion which Hitler, Hitler had put off. Uh, fortunately for our side. Uh, because they might have gotten to Moscow, but they didn't quite make it. Um, the, uh, there was a feeling, I think, that the Russians would not hold up, mm -hmm. but there was hope that they would, mm -hmm. somehow, that the Lend Lease would make a difference. Mm -hmm. And then in December of 42, just before Pearl Harbor, <laughs> maybe right afterwards, um, the, um, the Germans were stopped at the gates of Moscow. Yes. And the Russians counterattacked some of them Siberian troops with skis and uh, white uniforms in a snowstorm. And the Germans were driven back and they weren't equipped. They didn't have bo proper bo uh, boots or clothing and they were getting frostbite. And William Shira pretty well, in his book, The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich, pretty well documents uh, the, the uh, state of the German army in, as winter hit in uh, December of 41. So, when did the Second World War come home to you personally? Um, I turned 18 in July of 42, and the, the draft was at that time at age 20, and I, in, I enrolled in the University of California to attend summer school, so to break myself in for the full semester, which would start in September. So I was at summer school in July, and sometime in July or August, the draft age was lowered to 18. And uh, being 18, I, I was given a grace period before I had to register. And I was 18 years old, I have to say that. I, and I loved to hike, and I thought I wanted to go, into, I might as well go and enlist in the infantry because I liked to hike. 
And some of the seniors said, Phil, that's not your kind of hiking. <laughs> uh, and I thought about it, and they were going into the Air Force, and they persuaded me that that was a smart thing to do, because my own personal feeling was, this war is go I'm, going to, I'm going to be involved. I've enlisted in the Army Air Force, and I'll be called up eventually. And um, the war is going to last till 1947. Eight, and I'll, but then after it's over, I'll be much too old to want to go back to college. So I'll learn a skill and become an airline pilot. And uh, so I took the test in December of 42, was sworn in, raised my hand, uh, signed my name to something, um, and they said, you can finish your, your second semester of your freshman year and then we'll call you up. Well, six weeks later, they called us up. And so in, uh, on March the 3rd, 1943, um, we were told by t a telegram that uh, came from the president, I believe it said, greetings. <laughs> the famous uh, telegram. Be at Pier such and such <laughs> at 5 p.m. in San Francisco, March the 3rd. And I will never forget, people were coming, guys were coming, some holding hands with girlfriends, uh, some coming with their, with their parents. My parents came with me, I already said goodbye to my girlfriend. And it was kind of a, a Mardi Gras move, but I think it was a bravado hiding anxiety. And there must have been a thousand. And I remember that we were yakking and we hadn't been called to attention. And I guess we, some sergeant called us to attention. I didn't hear him. And I went on yakking and he said, hey, you in the brown, shut up. <laughs> and that is when my time in the military began. I think I said something like, yes, sir. And we got on a train and ended up in Lincoln, Nebraska for basic training. So what was it like? Had you ever thought of flying before? Had you ever had an no, experience of no. flying? My girlfriend, my high school girlfriend, who I met as a senior, and she was a, a Veronica Lake blonde, you know, with a mm -hmm. wavy hair that kind of obscured the, the right eye. She thought uh, pilots were just glamorous, you know, <laughs> and with the white with the uh, white scarf around your neck and the wings and the crushed 50 mission crushed hat, and that helped. Uh, she gave me a book on flying, which I which I read. And um, I, but I had never previously ever thought about flying. I had never flown in an airplane. So what kind of aircraft did you start flying in? We went to, after we went through the basic training, the period in which we were in college for, for a while, which I realized after the war was because they had so many cadets they couldn't put them through flight training, so they just stalled around and put us in college, then pre-flight at Santa Ana, then actual flying in December of 43 at Tex Rankin Field in uh, Tulare. And they were steermans you know, with the open cockpit. Mm -hmm. The instructor was up front and the cadet was in the back. And um, there were four of us per instructor. Mario Barsotti was one, later became a judge. I forget the names of the other two guys. Um, but Bars, I called him, we became good friends, and we hated our instructor. He was, uh, he was really mean and uh, belittled us, and we swore that we ever saw him after the war, we'd just tear, tear him apart. <laughs> and uh, so we, uh, we, we learned to fly, and I soloed uh, on my sixth hour. Yeah, and that was kind of scary, you know, when he finally said, the keys are yours, you take it up and fly around, come in and land. So that was December of 43 and January of 44 through the uh, primary flight training. Mm -hmm. And then we went to basic at Merced, which uh, the plane was a Volte uh, single engine aircraft, as was the Stearman, but they had a canopy and you could close, you could be enclosed. And uh, it was very noisy. We called it the Volte Vibrator, and it made such a <laughs> tremendous racket. And um, then we had night flying and formation flying and plane. It was a little easier to handle. Um, and then we went from there. We didn't know where we, were, you know, where, where, where they were going to put us. And I wanted to be a B-25 bomber pilot or a P-38 fighter pilot, twin engine. Mm -hmm. And they sent us to a twin engine, some of us. I mean, we went different directions after basic, but uh, many of us went to Marfa, Texas for advanced flight training, twin engine. And that was in probably April 
uh, early April of uh, 44, and we graduated in, uh, I graduated in May. I was, I was still nine, I was 19 years old, <laughs> and uh, here I am a second lieutenant, and I have my wings, and uh, came home on leave, very self-conscious, very self-conscious with this. And also proud, and so were my parents when they met me at the third and Townsend train station for a short leave after graduating. Did what? Let me ask you: What was your sensation on flying? Did you have? Did you fall in love with flying, as some people do, or did you just consider it another thing to do? Another thing to do. Another thing to do. Uh, uh, because it was dangerous, mm -hmm. uh, you couldn't uh, enjoy it like you might enjoy a, a hike or a day at the beach. Mm -hmm. uh, you had to be alert, and they they uh, had us practice simulated forced landing. So you know your engine might quit sometime. You'd mm -hmm. have to make a forced landing. So that was always in the back of your mind. Mm -hmm. You only had one engine. In advance, we had two. Uh, and then later with B-17, we had four. <laughs> but with a single engine aircraft. Uh, you know, the engine quit, uh, you had that in the back of your mind. Mm -hmm. And then when in formation flying, there was always the danger of collision, particularly when you're first learning. Yeah. So uh, later, uh, after the war, flying a B-17 in Africa to take photographs of the Sahara, uh, there were some fun times. Mm -hmm. And certainly, and I'll allude to it a little later, uh, the victory flight over Paris uh, it was a fantastic flight on VE Day, May the 8th, 1945. Now, let me ask you now, you've, you've gone through advanced training, twin engine training, now what happens? Uh, home on leave, up here for, at, the, at the Lagunillas cabin for a while. Um, then I had to report to Las Vegas for B-17 training. and. Um, it was July of 1944, and the heat thermals in uh, flying over the desert were tremendous. I mean, I had not anticipated it, and I always thought of the desert as what, what I saw in the film Bo Guest, <laughs> with Victor McLaughlin in the 30s, as kind of sandy and flat. Well, this is mountainous terrain around Las Vegas, and the air thermals were horrendous, and it was a gunnery school, so the gunners were learning to shoot at target sleeves, and I was learning to fly B-17 by a, an accomplished uh, instructor pilot. And um, uh, it was uh, the formation flying, uh, so we loosened it up because we were constantly, uh, the, the thermals just made the plane bounce considerably. And so I graduated and um, came home on, a, on a, about a two-week leave, spending some time here with my mother and father and grandmother and sister and brother. And then I had to report to Lincoln, Nebraska to be assigned to a crew. And with the crew then I would go through the, the operational training prior to being sent overseas. And um, I remember that my father drove me from here to San Francisco airport. I wouldn't call it international. I think it was still Mills Field. And he dropped me off at the steps. And I trotted up the steps and walked in, and there was maybe 50 yards in length, a, de a desk with every airline conceivable. And I bought my ticket, probably with United, and walked out, and there was hardly anyone. I mean, there wasn't anything like it is now. And I walked out on the tarmac, and I went up the staircase into the back of the plane, which was a DC-3. And I took my seat, and I, I uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a commissioned officer, I'm a pilot. But I'd never flown commercial airline, and I'm looking for my parachute. And I looked under the seat, and there's no parachute. And I looked up in the baggage rack, no parachute. And I called down, I said, stewardess, where are the parachutes? <laughs> and she comes running down to shut me up, because all the other passengers are turning and looking and wondering, you know. <laughs> she had said, sir, we, we don't need the parachutes. We have, we're, de we're equipped to deal with any kind of an emergency. Every, we, you know, you don't have to worry about it. So what happens if you get an engine fire and can't put it out? And she's shutting me up, you know. And I, I swept that flight out. I, I was very uncomfortable, very happy to land. You know, the parachute was a security blanket. Oh, why? That's why. Never had to use it. Thought I was going to have to once, but, but uh, it was a, a security blanket. Now we have finished this. You're going to uh, to uh, Nebraska to train with your operational crew. 
About how long does that take? What are your experiences of it? Well, we went, we were sent immediately to Ardmore, Oklahoma. Oh, yes. Um, to operational training. Mm -hmm. And there, the bombardiers practiced dropping flower sacks on, on targets that were consisted of well marked circles uh, 20,000 feet below. So that's the, what it was going to be in, in Europe or higher. And the gunners fired at, uh, at uh, sleeves told, uh, hauled by B-17s way in front of the, <laughs> the sleeve. Um, we did formation flying, night flying, uh, emergency procedures, learned how to feather an engine, how to put out a fire in the engine, and many things I don't remember. <clears throat> and then we, we were sent back to Lincoln uh, which is a staging area, and there, from there we would be sent overseas, but they didn't tell us where. But they issued us uh, machetes, a jungle kit, gave us Atterburn tablets, a lecture on, uh, on malaria and other jungle, other tropical diseases, and then let us go into town and told us not to talk. Well, they figured we would talk, and a couple of guys have too much to drink, and someone, a, a German spy, and in, <laughs> if there was one, in um, Lincoln would say, well, what, what, where are you guys going? Well, we must be going to the South Pacific. <laughs> so one day, maybe we were only there about four or five days, they, they closed the base to us, took away all of these things, and gave us woolens and said, you're going to England. <laughs> <laughs> so we went from there. Uh, on across the, nor the uh, North Atlantic uh, to England. Now, that was quite an experience. Um, was that an eventful trip across the Very North eventful, Atlantic? very. First part was uh, night flight from Lincoln to Bangor, Maine. We arrived in a snowstorm. We were stuck there uh, through Christmas, but there was a great party. They brought some girls in from the local college, and we had a dance uh, for Christmas. And uh, we had to go out and to sweep the snow off the wings and the airplane that was part of the routine. Uh, not much to do. Uh, then finally we had uh, good weather and we flew from there to Goose Bay, Labrador, where the temperature was minus 40 and really cold. And we had bad weather there and we had to wait and then they told us we could leave and we were taxiing out. There were B-24s and B-17s. And we were next in position when a B-24 ahead of us took off and then all of a sudden there's this big flash at the end of the runway and we're starting to snow and uh, we got a call to go taxi back all of us to our uh, hard stands and uh, the flight was called off but I remember that everybody in that B-24 but one person was killed and what happened I don't know I think probably uh, the pilot became disoriented in the, in the falling snow and it was dark it was about the middle of the night Finally, we got clearance and flew to Iceland, and we had to go over Greenland, and we were only about a thousand feet over Greenland when the, and we took off in dark. But by the time we got to Greenland, it was starting, and this is you know winter time, and I could see the mountains of Greenland um, not very far below, and you know very desolate looking country, and our navigator had to constantly take celestial readings off the sun, and the, the, he had a little bubble, a little plastic bubble from which he could put his head and put his sextant up, and I'm about, we're two of us, you know, behind the controls, and we could see him take a reading because even though we had a radio beacon coming out of Iceland, we were told the Germans would put up a submarine occasionally and give a false signal. They got, they knew that the signal, they had picked it up, they knew what it was, to draw this, draw a B-17 or B-24 off course. So to, as a double check, he kept, he had to do a celestial reading and it took about 20 minutes to get a fix and then he had to do it all over again. So the poor guy was doing fix all the way. And then we landed at Iceland and we, the airspeed was 90 miles an hour and we've, we landed in a 70 mile an hour gale. So here's this four engine bomber with a ground speed of 20 miles an hour. Oh it was absolutely <laughs> eerie. And uh, in, in Iceland, we were near, Reich, outside of Reykjavik, we never went into town. Sun came up about nine, went down about three. The wind never stopped. We finally got clearance and then flew to Wales and uh, saw our first greenery over Scotland, even though it was, some of it was a little snow covered. And there we were, uh, we landed. And I remember landing at Wales. I could not understand the accent of the tower instructor giving us landing instructors. So finally I said, to heck with it, I'm just gonna land. And I 
was met by a RAF jeep and an officer really chewed me out for landing the wrong way. But I, you know, I, and I, I held my tongue, uh, you know, but, because I, uh, but uh, I remember that uh, we were finally there. Were you, did you fly in, uh, in a group or did you fly no, singly? No, we took off singly. We were, at, we were staggered deliberately. We were told maybe to fly at 18, well, we, we were down probably about 10 or 11, 12,000 feet. But the planes were staggered and went off at intervals. And so to avoid the possibility of collision in the darkness. I see, yeah. I see. Because yeah. we had no lights. We didn't, mm -hmm. we didn't have running lights at all for security reasons, yeah. Sure. So you land in Wales and you're forming up as a bomber group. How soon after you've landed in England uh, are you sent on your first mission? Probably we were sent to a, to a base outside of Bedford at a little near a village called Thurlai. And uh, I was co-pilot at 20. My pilot was 25. Uh, and he went uh, they gave him a little, they gave him an orientation first, then they gave me one. Uh, he flew a couple of missions as co-pilot, and all of this took about two weeks, two and a half weeks, so that by sometime in February of 44, we were ready to fly our first mission as a crew, and so we did. And uh, I remember the first mission, I was nervous, <clears throat> and we were over Germany, and I saw these fighter planes up at 11 o'clock high, and I said, uh, bandits, 11 o'clock high. Bandits meant German fighter planes. Right. And some somebody more knowledgeable in the in the crew, who one of the gunners had been on a couple of preliminary missions, said those are P-51s. You know, they were they're our little friends, <laughs> but they looked I, <laughs> they do look they like ME-109s. They, they looked like ME-109. Yeah. yeah. So uh, what was your you you're being you're going into combat for the first time? Where in Germany were you bombing? Uh, I, I have a list of all the targets, but I remember a place called Halle, H-A-L-L-I-E, mm -hmm. uh, Oranienburg, or, or outside the uh, suburb of Berlin, Frankfurt, uh, Leipzig, mm -hmm. um, uh, a target near Merseburg, which was heavily defended, um, Bremen, mm -hmm. uh, Hamburg. Mm -hmm. Those are the ones that come immediately to mind. I and see. So what was your first mission over? Frankfurt. Frankfurt. <coughs> yeah. So that was really it was fairly a, deep in the heart of Germany. Yeah, and it was pretty good, uh, quite a bit of flack. Mm -hmm. um, being this was towards the end of the war, the German fighters' strength was weakened, but they had less territory to defend because they were, they were losing, had lost a good part of Italy, they were retreating in Russia. So they, they had probably as many or more 88 millimeter anti-aircraft uh, gun. It was, it was a, a, a great gun. A 88 millimeter was mm -hmm. a, could be used in in uh, infantry combat, just uh, and also as a, as an anti-aircraft gun. They had another one that fired 100 and, uh, 105 millimeter shells, and that made a white burst. The uh, the 88s made a black burst. And I didn't see everything because I've got a wing under me and mm -hmm. half the time I'm flying formation and I'm guiding off a plane mm -hmm. over here and we flew very tight because mm -hmm. it was protection from fighters. Fighters didn't like to jump a tight formation because that meant more concentrated machine gun fire from each of four machine gunners in each of 12 aircraft. Mm -hmm. And so our squadron commander insisted on very tight formation. In fact, when we had a day off, he said, we're going upstairs and we're practicing formation flying. And he went with us and would, would call, you know, criticize people for So I flew with my wing overlapping. This is the wing of the plane I'm guiding on. We're a little bit above. And I'm, my wing is just about overlapping. You know, I think back, there's no way would I do that again. And it, there was always a danger of collision. And uh, so we had a we had a tight formation from the very beginning, but there was uh, there was quite a bit of flack. But I, because of the wing under me, I couldn't see a lot of the stuffs going on. And as I say, half the time I'm guiding and watching, so I th see things going out going on out of the corner of my eye. Planes pulling out, getting hit. But the ball turret gunner who's underneath me saw a, t a tremendous show destructive show because a lot of the formations were staggered left and right at different altitudes and he saw direct hits and he was one of the most important persons to be debriefed because he could tell because uh, he saw more and he could say well yes because we, there were th three squadrons in our group and the low squadron might he could see the low 
And if the plane got a direct hit, he would then, did he see any shoots? Well, I saw two, or I saw three, or I didn't see any. Mm -hmm. So that that helped intelligence re report back home that so-and-so was missing, but we, we believe he will be a prisoner of war because shoots were seen. Um, <coughs> what was your feeling, your emotional, your physical, your nervous reaction to being in this kind of combat? <coughs> I think I'd be more nervous now. I had this, you know, it was a long time ago. I think I had the confidence of youth that uh, our plane would have to have a direct hit for anything would happen to me. And actually, a piece of flak could have hit me, just, you know, although I had a flak helmet. Uh, the planes uh, came back with people who were dead or wounded, and the, the, air, the plane perfectly airworthy. But I somehow thought I'd get through, and I I knew exactly, I, I had my parachute under, right underneath me. I could clamp it on, and I'd go out that escape hatch. I, w I knew I wouldn't hesitate to jump. Um, I was scared, I mean, particularly uh, on the bomb run when we couldn't take evasive action, we had to hold a steady course. The fighters left us alone uh, and for that period, and which might be five minutes and, or more, and then the, the flak is, you know, the, the, it was pretty, it was more accurate and more, more damaging. Uh, we, we never, we were lucky. We had a few holes. No one got hit. That could have happened. Uh, in other planes that happened. Other planes went down. But we were, you know, very, very lucky. But uh, the idea of doing it now is, is, would be really scary. I mean, I just, I wouldn't, I wouldn't <laughs> want to do it. Uh, because I lived long enough to realize there are no guarantees. And at the time I knew, I suppose I knew there were no guarantees, but I, I, was, I was scared, but I wasn't just terrified. In other words, you were so busy, I was in, busy. The course of, in the course of doing the mission that you really didn't have time to be overly scared. Right, right. But between missions, you might think about it. Yeah, yeah. And we were always hoping at the briefing uh, when the, when Major Bain's father would come down the aisle, and then he was the intelligence officer, and all, someone say, "Titch Hut," and he would say, "Sit down, sit down." He was very unmilitary. Sit down, relax, you guys. And he'd come up and banter a little bit with the guys in the front row, and then he'd say, "Well, gentlemen, I guess they get it over with." And they had this big sheet covering a map of Western Europe, and he'd pull a string. Today's target is, and then it would be a big. Uh, cardboard sign up there saying uh, whatever it said and if it was we anticipated that it was going to be a heavily defended target the bravado was a big big boo and if it was a, a target that was not going to be heavily defended everybody would cheer at least we thought it would not be heavily defended but sometimes as you were flying over germany uh, <clears throat> even though intelligence said you avoid this place and that place there would be unexpected flak from which we could take evasive action. Mm -hmm. It took about 25 seconds for the shell to reach our altitude. So about every 25 seconds, the, the lead plane would change course, or climb, or change course and climb. That's interesting. That's yeah. interesting. So how many, how many missions did you fly altogether? 21. 21 missions? Yeah. OK. And at the, at the end of the war, you describe, and I think it's absolutely wonderful description. You told me the story, and I read about it, but it's the VE Day, May 8th, yeah. over Paris. Yeah. And I'd love to hear that yeah. story again. I got goose pimples when I think about it. Um, we were assigned to take the nurses and the mechanics and other ground personnel to Germany to show them what they had contributed to the ruins, and I didn't particularly like that idea. I, I had never seen them at close hand because we were always 25, 22 to 25,000 feet, but I knew it was going to be pretty appalling. But first, we had to go to Paris because there was a celebration going on in Paris, and that I looked forward to. I'd never been to Paris, and so we came in very low. Uh, over the channel. We had to lift up to, to avoid the low hills at Normandy. Mm -hmm. And then I remembered while we were still over England, just after we left, there were people waving the Union Jack in the streets and uh, they were on, on church steeples and uh, on, uh, on uh, the, 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 those double-decker buses. And then the same thing happened over the over Normandy, uh, from every little village that the Union Jack and the French flag was flying, not the American flag. Maybe we, we had worn out our welcome. And I remember a a tractor 
guy was on the tractor and he looked up at us. We were, you know, 200 feet and he waved his French flag at us. And so we came into Paris and I was flying and I went by, we loosened up the formation because none of us were looking at each other, we were looking at the city. <laughs> and the city, it was a beautiful day just like today and the uh, sun was sparkly, not a cloud in the sky. And the Parisians were in the street, just mobs. The, every street was jam-packed with people all waving the tricolor or the Union Jack and maybe an American flag. I, you know. But I went by the Eiffel Tower <coughs> lower. I think there's some kind of a restaurant halfway up. Yes. I went by lower than that and the people were all waving the flag. <laughs> and, and, and then I thought, I don't want to get killed celebrating the end of the war, so I lifted up. So I saw the, the Champs Elysees, uh, the Sacre Coeur, the Ark of Triumph, um, the, um, the Eiffel Tower, and I think we saw the Louvre, I'm not sure, we, we debated later. <laughs> then we went over Germany, over the Ruhr, having gone around Paris three or four times, just having a great time. And uh, in the Ruhr, it was appalling. It was 9-11 a thousand times. Yeah. The, the buildings were honeycombed. Some of the walls would be standing. As we approached, it looked like at first everything was intact, but then as soon as we came over the city, you could look at the ground floor and many of the buildings and uh, went over the uh, Cologne and I got a picture of the un so-called untouched cathedral of Cologne. The Americans made it a lot of publicity, uh, made a lot of uh, big to-do about that because uh, they claimed our precision bombing was so good that we did avoided hitting the cathedral. Well, that was sheer luck. Because <laughs> right. um, everything around it was just uh, devastated. But I saw the Weimar flag flying in the ruins of Aachen and Dusseldorf. And I didn't know how to interpret that. And then I thought to myself, well, maybe that's the anti-Nazis saying, long live the real Germany, we too are glad the war is over. And on a peace march in San Francisco in the 70s, uh, maybe it was an anti-Vietnam war march, I'm not sure, I uh, was wearing part of my uniform, marching with some veterans, some, and um, not many of us, but a few, and a guy came up and said, excuse me, were you a, a pilot, an American pilot in Verlvato? And I said, yes. He says, I was a Luftwaffe pilot. And he was marching to protest either the nuclear arms race or the Vietnam War. I think it was the nuclear arms race. And we locked arms, kind of ironic. Who knows, he may have been one of those pilots shooting at me. Yeah. But um, I told him what I just told you about the flags. He says that's exactly what it was. So really? there's anti-Nazis saying long live the real Germany. Really? We too are glad the war is over. So we, as we were flying back, I, f I don't know why, but I flicked off of the intercom over to high frequency radio and I picked up Winston Churchill giving a victory address in the House of Commons. And I still have the letter that I wrote when I got back to the base where there was a huge celebration and a lot of the people were, a lot of the guys were just, you know, blotto. My mother was a teetotaler and I couldn't, could, couldn't say blotto or skunked or whatever, you know, <laughs> one of the many different euphemisms for being really drunk. So I wrote, that I said some of the men were tight. <laughs> yeah, very memorable experience, you know, and, and also realizing no more missions, the war is over. Uh, I'm alive. Yeah. 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 That it was a sense uh, of relief. Yeah. I remember, you know, during the war, and it's never been my experience since, from whatever engagement we've been, the total commitment of the population, we are here on the state side, and I'm in the Middle yeah. West, Yeah. and the population was totally committed to this war. I remember uh, saving Greece, uh, which would m later be rendered for nitroglycerin. Uh, saving uh, tin cans, yeah. uh, contributing to, yeah. yes, anything we could do. And, and the sense was austere. The sense was, we are committed to this. This is a just war. My brother, also in a kind of ironic thing, uh, joined the Merchant Marine in 42. And in 43, he uh, was on a uh, liberty ship going to Murmansk, carrying supplies to the Russians, the son of the father who declared that the Germans would collapse in six weeks. Huh. And uh, <laughs> I can remember the total commitment uh, that we experienced. And it was not, it was a funny time because it was a time, it was a sense of time suspended. During the war, uh, in, for you of course, in the service, there was clearly a sense of time 
in a different sense. But in the civilian world there was too. Things were different. The temple was different. Things, people came and went. Uh, things changed. Uh, but the essential thing was we were always looking at the newspaper, always seeing the newsreels, just the radio, finding out what was happening in the world beyond. And I think, by and large, my school generation was better educated internationally than generations since have been, just because of the war. Well, you're a graduate of the University of Chicago. Yes. And the only universe, pure university, in as much as somewhere along the line had abolished football yes, because they it didn't con a a it considered it was not compatible with a, with an institution of higher learning. Right, Mr. Hutchins. Yes, now, I, that was my sense when I was home on leave. There was never, there was n nothing like it is now or during the Vietnam War. There was the people were solidly behind the war effort. Oh, um, and. The newspapers, uh, when I was on leave, were devoted entirely to what was going on in the war, whatever theater, all the theaters. Yeah. Uh, and so the, the, the nation was probably, probably never as united, even more, I think, possibly in World War I. Oh, I think uh, so. Yeah, and certainly even the Civil War, there were all kinds of draft riots, I understand. Oh, yes. Uh, Excellent a, movie called yeah. uh, The Gangs of New York about the Irish draft yeah. riots. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, there was there was no hesitation. There was no lack of commitment. And yeah. of course, we had a great leader. And uh, my mother, Paul, I'm going to reach over here and get this flag here. My mother flew this flag all during the war, and fl you know, flags flags upside down, indicating that America is in distress because of the war. This is a 48 star flag uh, for Hawaii and. Uh, um, Alaska hadn't been admitted to the Union, and she flew, uh, she flew this flag from the balcony of our house all during the war and had it out when I came home. It was right, uh, right over my head when I came home at the end of the war. Okay, this is a picture of my crew uh, before a mission. Most of the time we took off in the darkness, but this mission obviously had been delayed. Sometimes they were delayed and were postponed. Uh, and we didn't get off until it was light, and, and so we got back just before dark. But uh, I'm, in the, I'm the one in the crew, with the crew cut, uh, second from the right, as you are, are viewing it. I did not take this picture. It was taken by one of the guys in our squadron, of one of the planes in our squadron. But this guy's, uh, this B-17 has been hit. And he's one of the few that still had the olive drab. Most of us had the were just aluminum, and weren't painted. But they they went they changed that in '42 or '43. But he's been hit. A piece of flak has hit the engine, and it's starting to burn. And uh, I didn't see this happen. It was in our, it was in our squadron. Uh, and as I said earlier, I couldn't see everything that was going on. Uh, and. Uh, he may have gone down, I'm not sure. You know, we, would, we would lose a plane now and then. One mission, we lost three. And there were some times when I was stood down, our crew was stood down, and a number of planes were hit, direct hits. Yes, it was called Fuddle's Folly, and I don't know who named it. <laughs> uh, it was passed on to us. Uh, and we, we added, you know, you can see the, uh, the um, there were, when you saw it, there were, Picture there were the uh, bombs mm -hmm. the painted on it to indicate a mission completed. Yeah. Um, so the war is over. What happens next? Are you well? We thought we were going to go home. We wanted to go home, mm -hmm. but they uh, someone had an idea of making better maps of Western Europe and even Africa. So they converted our bomb group to a photo group, and the mission was called the Casey Jones mission, which was to make new photographs from. Uh, new maps from photographs, aerial photographs. So we had to fly over f France and Germany and Spain uh, at high altitude and hold a steady course. Uh, we were on autopilot half the time. The navigator was really in, in control. He would say, move two degrees to the right, so we'd make a change. Uh, and uh, I, I guess it was the navigator photographer who was do doing this, who would, would really direct the uh, uh, the course of the plane. So I got to see Lake Geneva from 20,000 plus feet. And so we did that. We did the Azores. Uh, we could only fly in the morning because the clouds build up in the afternoon. So we had to spend the afternoon on the beach.
Oh, which what was a great. hardship! Oh, it was, it was, it was. Uh, Peace as hell. Yeah, it was, it was, <laughs> it was a great time, and I remember getting into a discussion with some Portuguese soldiers on the Azores, and I had had high school Spanish, but it, I, through disuse I was quite rusty. But I, I could understand with their question when they wanted to know if America and Horuthia would go to have a guerra or war. And I said, uh, you know, the United Nations it was now uh, you know, an organization that would preserve peace. And I gave them this very optimistic answer, which I sincerely believed. And uh, that was kind of fun. We spent a lot of time drawing pictures in the sand to communicate. Uh, then we went to uh, North Africa. We stopped at, we were going to go to Dakar, but we had to stop at Casablanca. And to Marrakesh, too. Um, at Casablanca, six of us thought that we would uh, have a good time seeing the town. So we did. We went to this French bar, and they were singing, and we joined them fake with fake French. And then we came to the, the Arab quarter. They had se the Arabs were segregated. And in English, Arabic, and French, it said off-limits to allied military personnel. But there was this kid who saw dollar signs. He said, hey, Joe's. We we're all Joe. I take you through. And so, well, how much? We gave him quite a bit of money. But we said, we give you twice that when you deliver us to the other side. <laughs> I walked back into biblical times. It was an incredible experience. Uh, veiled women carrying water jars on her shoulder or on her heads, uh, lepers, uh, a little, buzz, little uh, shops which were uh, with lit by candles. And every conversation would stop as we walked fast through this Arab quarter. Stucco, white stucco, it was a moonlit night, um, no sanitation to speak of, uh, uh, a merchant with his passing with his donkeys with, laden with the goods of some one kind or another. And uh, then we went to Dakar and uh, we ran out of oxygen and more was sent, but sent to the wrong place. So for two or three weeks all we did was check in and then go to the beach. Then finally, I remember after we got the oxygen, I had to do a, a flight from Dakar up to Marrakesh. Maybe I refueled at Marrakesh. By this time, they promoted me to full pilot. And I had to fly back to Dakar. And I thought, wouldn't it be fun to fly right down the African coast just off the water? So I flew about 50 to 75 feet above the water all the way down the African coast. Once in a while, someone would say, look at that, and there'd be a, some camel dri uh, camels and a camel driver going uh, uh, through the desert, which was right immediately to our left, because we were right over the water. And then we came to, I saw a city. I had to lift up. It was all white stucco, and the people were all quite startled. And I later learned it was a Spanish colony called Rio de Oro, and the city was Villa Cisneros. Hmm. And, uh, but I had to lift up went over probably 100 feet above the city. And then since we went past, we went back down right along the water again, all the way back to the car. And then we had to lift up a little bit to get into the landing pattern. But that was uh, a fantastic experience. And so warm, I had the windows of the plane open, which was kind of a no-no. <laughs> well, that sounds very exciting. Yeah, it was. It was a lot of fun. So then you continued the mapping? We continued the mapping. And then finally, I had enough points to go home, and I received word that I could go home, and so we were flown to from Dakar to Marseille, and uh, I was what they called sandbagging. I wasn't flying; I was just I was standing behind the pilot while he was flying, and we were in a storm over the Pyrenees, and uh, I said uh, something about, "Are we high enough?" You know, and he said, "Well, the navigator says we are," <laughs> and. Uh, we were supposed to have broken out well over the Mediterranean. When we broke out, we were right over Marcelo uh, Barcelona, which means as the, you know, the range was going down, we were going down. Fortunately, we didn't collide with anything. With anything. And then we took a tr train from Marseille to uh, our base in Giebelstadt, Germany, which is not far from Schweinfurt. And then we took f what were called 40 and 8s from World War I, 40 men. 40 men and eight horses, I think they were called. We didn't have any horses on them, but they were, they were freight train, uh, cars. And we were very slow moving through Germany because of the ruins and, and the rails were in disrepair, to say the least. Got to Le Havre, 
And from Lahore, we got on a Liberty ship. Um, one guy smuggled a monkey that he had got, had got in Africa. And the monkey's name was Casey Jones. And Casey and I went on uh, on sick call at the same time. He got seasick and I got seasick <laughs> on the Liberty ship. And they gave us both the same stuff to drink. And um, we went into New York Harbor, which I'd never been to New York, and uh, walked over the Jersey side to Cap Kilmer, the formalities, uh, whatever they were. And then we were put on a train and uh, went all the way to Camp Beale in Sacramento, where we went through a few more formalities. And the last thing that happened was a lecture by a colonel. We're all sitting, a bunch of officers are sitting there, pilots. And he's trying to talk us into enlisting for six years. And he's citing all the perks and the, the increased salary, et cetera, all the benefits. Of, and we listened. And finally he said, uh, when you conclude, he said, are there any questions? And I raised my hand. He said, yes, lieutenant. I was now promoted to first lieutenant. Uh, I said, is that all, sir? <laughs> he, he smiled and laughed, and I walked out, got on the bus, and went home. And um, I hadn't told my parents exactly when I was coming. I sent them a telegram that said, Westward Ho, from the Liberty ship. But then we were told at Camp Kilburn, New Jersey, you shouldn't surprise your parents. Some guys, parents have died from heart attacks. So I thought, I better let my parents know. So I said, I'll be home sometime the week of such and such. And i never forgotten, you know, the reunion that we had when I knocked on the door, hit the knocker, and, and uh, how we embraced and had a wonderful dinner together. And it was, you know, it was, it was now over. What year was that? May of 46. May of 46. April. April of 46. A April of 46. So it would be, what's that, 60 years ago? 60 this, years ago. Oh my, maybe this, to this, this day, one, for all I know. Perhaps this day. Yeah. Isn't that something? Yeah. Or, uh, you were home, you just knocked on your parents' door, yeah. and now you have to figure out what you're going to do with your life after this after a sue of four years, five years. Well, I, I knew I w wasn't too old to go back to college, not at 22. No! <laughs> uh, the war ended sooner than I thought. And so I was too, it was too late for me to enroll at Cal Berkeley uh, since it was in the middle of the spring semester. But I went over to Cal to meet my friends and even jobbed a paper for a buddy of mine who was so madly in love he didn't have time to study. And he's very embarrassed to this day because he was a good student and a conscientious person and a very honest person, but he was just so madly in love with this gal. <laughs> and I couldn't wait. I couldn't wait to go to college. I wanted to learn for the first time in my life. So I jumped at the opportunity to write a paper, I forget what it was on, on a speech course. And I mean, I had to do some research, and he got an A on it, or I got an A. And I felt good about it because then I was confident that I could do college work. And I'd been a good student in high school, but uh, only because I wanted to uh, stay eligible for track and, and get to Cal Berkeley and run on the track team. But I had no real interest in learning. Uh, in high school, but now I really wanted to learn for the first time. And so in the fall of September of 46, I enrolled at Cal Berkeley. Just uh, I remember what a sense of joy I had. The girls were so beautiful, and I, was, I made the soccer team, I made the first team. Uh, of, of guys who were mostly from foreign countries, but I was faster than anybody else, and that's only, and more aggressive. So I, they put me on the first team at the outside right wing. And uh, we won the championship, and uh, so I, I, and a lot of the veterans were in a big hurry to get back, to get caught up. So they were taking 18, 21 units. I took 12 units, 13 units. I wanted the full flavor, full four years of college, and, I, and track and soccer and, and the beautiful girls. You know, I, I, I will interrupt. I went to the University of Chicago in the fall of 1946, so I was right in the middle of that great stream of veterans, veterans coming back. And I must say, they went. They often went to Chicago because you can get through faster. Uh, Chicago, uh, if you placed well, if you've done uh, work and you placed out, you could make it through in two years with a Ooh. bachelor's degree. But that really didn't mean much because it meant that you then had to specialize since it was a general liberal arts curriculum. But enormous number of really interesting people in that time and I think that 
uh, the age difference and the experience difference was very beneficial to me as a person because I, if I had been with my so-called peers, it would have been much duller. So you were about 18? I was 17, 18 17. when I went to Chicago. And it would have been my... You were now in a company of guys 22, 3, 4, 5. Or, or yeah. older, yeah. who had been through a great deal. Some of them been infantrymen, some of them been pilots, some of them been, you know, whatever. But they had a lot of life experience. And uh, they were very dedicated. They were very focused. Uh, we didn't have fraternities. We didn't have uh, sports. So it was all pretty much focused. But uh, it was a wonderful, wonderful time, uh, as I remember yes. it, in, in the company of those veterans. And I think that, that, uh, that uh, today's schools just don't have that kind of interest in vitality. I sense that's the case. Yeah. Uh, but let's go on with your story. Well, there you go. You, you, what? Then what do you decide you want to do? Do you want to? Do you, what was I? I didn't know. So I had. I was a general curriculum major. I didn't have a specific major. Mm -hmm. And after two and a half years, I went over to the history or to the political science department and dumped my units on the table, so to speak, and said, "Do I have enough units to have a major?" They said, "Definitely. You also have a minor in history if you want it." So I had a major in political science, a minor in history, though I took a lot of anthropology and psychology. Um, then I decided probably at the end of my junior year I wanted to teach. Uh, and I, I thought about teaching on a college level, but I, I wanted to get started now. And uh, I, I did do a master's degree, but I thought, see, to do a PhD, it'll tell me another year or two, and I, I'm ready to go out and and save the world in the classroom by <laughs> raising the level of consciousness of, consciousness of uh, young people. And so I, uh, in the School of Education, I had a social studies major with an English minor. And uh, so I had, in a sense, two majors. Outside of the School of Education, I had a major in political science and a minor in history. And then it was called social studies in the School of Education. The School of Education wasn't as good as the, as the rest of the departments in the university. Yeah. And, uh, the most valuable thing I learned was how to, how to work on a 16 millimeter motion picture projector, <laughs> uh, which I used a lot in, uh, in uh, teaching. And I have one of the films that I used a great deal, which is called The Twisted Cross. Oh. The rise, an encapsulated 50 minute version of the rise and fall of Nazi Germany. And a colleague of mine showed it too. We both chose to joke that if, if the soundtrack ever broke down, he could do the music and I could do the narrative and the kids would never be the wiser. <laughs> so anyway, then I went into uh, teaching and I taught for, uh, got married shortly before going into uh, teaching uh, in my graduate year. And then I got married and then uh, took a job at the Sequoia Union High School District taught at Sequoia High School, coached track at the same time, and uh, then moved to another school, a brand new school within the district, and I taught for 28 years. It was a calling. I loved it. It was a challenge. I taught with one hand, fought the administration with the other, and, um, and I ran around the track during the lunch hour. They couldn't. I, teachers are great on meetings, and I had the state code gave me an hour for lunch, and I remember once the principal was mad at me because of, of an editorial I'd written criticizing the administration, he came down to speak to me about it, and, and I was running. And as I, he, as I went by him, I said, uh, I'll see you at 1 o'clock, Ivan. Uh, now I have, a, I have, the state gives me an hour, an hour for my lunch hour. So, I, you know, and I kept running. I had tenure, or I wouldn't have been able to do that. So I ran it four times a week during the lunch hour and loved teaching and did that for 28 years, and then allegedly retired and moved here to Lagunitas in the summer, August of 1979. So I would conclude by saying that uh, I was very lucky, very, very lucky in World War II. Uh, could very well not be here. Uh, and people were, you know, planes went down around me. Uh, guys were sometimes killed in the plane by flak or badly wounded, and the plane got back. And I remember seeing one guy come in firing red flares, which meant dead or wounded on board, and he had two engines knocked out on one side. So he had to land that plane with only two good engines, both on the left side, and one tire was flattened, and he made it. Wow. But a B-17 was a very stable aircraft. Guys, guys came back uh, 
with one engine, not the whole way, but they would maybe lost two to flak and then one went out and maybe they were over England and they could manage to get back. Not the B-24, but the B-20 and B-17 is a very stable aircraft. So in, in conclusion, I was really very, very, very lucky. Well, it's been a really interesting experience to speak with you and to share experience and to listen to yours. And having lived through the same period of time, somewhat younger, um, I think it, it, it's important to maintain these, these views and these memories. It's yeah. important, especially now, when they're being forgotten, because <clears throat> as we know, history is not well remembered or nope. even learned from most of the time. The only thing we we'll learn from history is that we don't learn anything from history. <laughs> Someone said, that's not my quote. And I think it wasn't it Bismarck who said, those who don't learn from history are doomed or repeated. Yeah. Was it Bismarck? Yeah. I think it was Bismarck. Yeah. So here we are again. So here we are again. And maybe about to drop atomic, what they call them, buster bombs? Bunker uh, busters. Uh, the bunker busters yes. on in Iran. I, uh, I don't know. Well, I'm glad I was born when I was born. And yeah. I. Yeah. And and, yeah. and I too. Okay.